What's up? In today's episode, we talk about veganism, the right and the wrong way to do it. <laughs> all the controversy around Andrew Tate. You're all losers. We've discussed this before. I'm the king of the world. And then we have four live callers that call in. One of them wanted to know about strength training for kids. And another one had low back problems and can't figure out the cause. By the way, if you want to just look at short clips of great fitness information, you don't want to watch a whole episode, go to our Mind Pump Clips channel on YouTube. All right, here comes the show. If you're going to go vegan, do it for the right reasons. Otherwise, it's likely to lead to worse health. I know. Keep going after the <laughs> yeah, We gave him like uh, 30 days off. Yeah. So, we did. yeah so no, we okay. So, like study. The, I just healed. Another study yeah. came I out. I know. That, um, new study. I saw Max Lugavir posted it. He yeah. He did. And it shows that strict adherence to a plant based diet leads to a much higher consumption of ultra processed foods. All right. So, let's clarify when I say if you're going to go vegan, do it for the right reasons. When you look at the data on vegans that not only do a better job going vegan, in other words, they pick, they make better food choices, they're less likely to get nutrient deficiencies because those tend to be more common in purely vegan diets. And people, and those same people who tend to stick to the diet because uh, other, otherwise vegan diets, like any diet, people fall off after a certain period of time at something like 85% rate. Those people who do well uh, in on vegan diets, the main motivating factor for them is a deep passion for the well-being of animals. Mm -hmm. Their motivation is not weight loss. Their motivation is not improving my health. Their motivation is not helping the environment or the climate or pollution. Their motivation is, I really want, I don't want animals to die. It's mainly animal cruelty is their passion. And not right. just animal cruelty, but they have a deep passion for just any, like, I don't want animals to die at all. Any life. And yeah, and I, I'm, and this is why I'm doing this. And what happens because of that belief, because it's such a strong uh, core tenant for these people, that they do the work. They do the work of making it work for them in their life. They go through and try to, you know, eat it healthy and watch the nutrient deficiencies and they stick to it. They're, they're consistent with it. Everybody else, number one, falls off. They fall off like any other diet. Keto diet, paleo diet, you know, cucumber juice diet or whatever, uh, vegan diet. They fall off afterwards very quickly. Well, because what are you going to replace your super uh, satiating type of a meat that uh, uh, you need to to make sure now it has to be like from a vegan well, source? Well, What's that's that going to look that's like? The that's, that's, that's the main problem. That's the main problem because the the people that watched the documentary that went viral what a few years ago, what the health right it was what the health yeah. was it called that watched that documentary. And I had I had several family members that were not vegan before that documentary. Then after that mm -hmm. documentary, I'm eating dinner with them and I'm, well, I'm like, what's going on with you? Oh, I'm vegan now. Are they still vegan? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, they're not. That was, <laughs> oh, no, yeah, they're not anymore. Yeah. And, and, you know, and during that time, it was like, they would all go, did you see the documentary? What yeah. the hell? I'm like, yes, I saw it. <laughs> but what they do is they just cut out meat. They literally eat exactly the same. They cut out meat. The and, only and whole then, natural food they right, have. Right, and then the normal, the thing that replaces is all this artificial processed bullshit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just not ideal. Now, in defense, okay, and I, I don't wanna, I'm going to come to the defense of the vegans in this because I don't see uh, much of a difference, in my opinion, uh, in the keto diet. In um, fact, my experience going through the keto diet, I remember, uh, you know, reporting back to the guys, like, you know what I find myself doing is eating butter, and macadamia nuts, bacon. yeah, and bacon, like, like just like a, a lot of yeah. all those foods, and that because you don't have a lot of options, those are the easiest things that you tend to find in your refrigerator. And you know, all I was doing was cutting out carbs, and so I had to eat these really high fat foods, and then also trying to get some protein in there. And I kind of found myself gravitating to a very small rotation of foods, and I, it was, I was like, this can't be ideal for me to eat like this forever. Not, plus, I don't want to. I'm mean, going to be yeah. lame. To well, with a keto fat. diet, what you may find, what's more common in a ketogenic diet is a deficiency in fiber, right? It's common in yeah. a ketogenic diet. Why? You're eliminating carbohydrates, and there are lots of carbohydrate sources where people tend to get their fibers mm -hmm. from. So they cut out carbs, and instead of replacing those with like fibrous, non-carbohydrate-type vegetables, they tend to not do that. So you run into like fiber issues. Well, with vegans who don't do it well, who aren't well planned with it, like what people don't realize is with the vegan diet, you have to kind of plan it in a, a more special way because you have to make sure that you don't come up with nutrient deficiencies, B vitamins, iron, for example, uh, choline is very hard to come by uh, in a vegan diet or actually impossible, right? So what you tend to see with vegans is either they supplement, so they supplement with key nutrients that they're not going to get from their food, 
or they plan it really, really well. And it tends to be more or less whole food based and they tend to prepare their foods. Okay. That's when people do it right. Mm -hmm. People who do it wrong, what they do is they say, okay, I'm just going to avoid all animal products. So they go to the grocery store That's right. and they go, well, I can get some fruits and vegetables, but let me get this meatless burger patty. Mm -hmm. Let me get these meatless hot dogs. And oh, wait, are these potato chips? Uh, vegan? Yes, they are. Are these other snacks? Oh yeah, yeah look at all these vegan for snacks. The label if it says vegan. On yeah, it. and they end up with with often nutrient deficiencies because there's certain nutrients that are either hard to come by or or you don't really find them in plant sources, um, and you only get them in meat sources. And then to the point with the study that Max posted is, you know, if you look at the average Westerner's diet, especially in America, and you were to analyze it, and it's this has creeped up right over the over the last few decades, the amount, the percentage of our diet that's been made up of heavily processed foods, which we all know lead to overeating, tend to be less healthy, probably the main cause of obesity. Those that that food consumption, which has crept up on its own anyway, which now makes up about sixty to seventy percent of the average American's diet. If you look at the percentage of their food that is not ultra processed, it's usually eggs, milk, and meat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's like. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take the only whole food diet whole, whole foods out of their diet and what they're likely to replace it with which is what the study shows is more ultra processed, processed foods. Food. So yeah. now they're going to eat worse than they did before, their health is worse, they get nutrient deficiencies, they don't feel good and you run into a, a lot of different problems. Not to mention all the fake versions of meat suck in comparison. So it's like then you're you're all, you're getting less nutrients and then you're taking in something that is just doesn't yeah. doesn't taste as good as what you're having before. or less bioavailable no yeah vegetable oils yeah. and all that stuff or less bioavailable uh, nutrients yeah. so sometimes what they'll do is they'll even make these uh, animal product substitutes and they'll add vegan ingredients to make up for the nutrient deficiencies yeah plant proteins and plant based vitamin D and plant you know other vitamins and nutrients and certain types of iron that you find in plants. The problem is many of these nutrients are far less bioavailable. For example, vitamin D, you can get a form of vitamin D from mushrooms, but it's way less bioavailable than the vitamin D you would get from, for example, um, cod liver oil, right? Vitamin D3, right? Vitamin D2 is the one that you tend to find in vegetables. That's one example. So you end up with a lot of problems, poor health issues, and then we can go down, of course, the list of all the other uh, problems that comes from. So really, if you view veganism as a diet, it's going to fail and you're going to do terribly and you're going to feel bad, just like almost any other diet. Right. If, you view, if you view veganism as a way of life, as part of the your one of your core beliefs, the data shows you can make it work. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort and some learning, but you're more likely to be successful doing, that way, doing it that way. And this is the advice I've, I gave to clients the last probably 10 years that I train people. Today's giveaway for this episode, MAPS Anabolic, the program that started it all. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section. That's where we're going to notify you that you get free access to MAPS Anabolic. Also, we have a sale going on right now. Two workout program bundles on sale. We have the Skinny Guy Bundle. It's got all these amazing workout programs included. And then we have the Fit Mom Bundle, which has all these other amazing workout programs included. Both programs, 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below to get our discount. All right, here comes the show. Speaking of data, have you guys seen the new Dyson vacuum cleaner? I heard the it new sucks. one? I heard it sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you ruined my dad, Joe. <laughs> Doug, I think oh. you just said that. Pull oh. this up. Dyson, uh, Dyson, I think V15 Detect, I believe is the brand. Uh, I, I had so if, I don't know how this works. If it was like so I saw it in my feed first, and then I get at like all because I clicked on it, and I was yeah, like, dude. now I see it everywhere. But it actually is is picking. Are you pulling it up yet, Doug? I want the guys. I'm, to, I'm want, grabbing it. Yeah. yeah, I want the guys to see. I see feel this. like his genius is so wasted. Like, why is he innovating so much in like the vacuum? Who Dyson? Space? Yeah, uh -oh. like he's so like. Is that it right there? Yeah. But, okay. They've made check so it out. many cool products, but it's like, who cares? It's still vacuum cleaner. All right. So what does it do? So it actually has a percentage breakdown of what you're. So it actually is breaking like like mites and dust and like it actually oh, wow. gives you. It a, analyzes your dirt. Yes, yeah, it, yes, it analyzes oh, what you're man. what you're cleaning up in your house. Wait, so you no, got all on. the DNA and everything. Hold on, oh, oh, Justin, oh, I love yeah, you. So I'm ruining it again. I'm I love you so much, Justin. Yeah. Does this thing connect to Yo, like the internet? Like Wi-Fi or internet? I don't know. That I don't know. Oh my god. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. chemical composition of Adam Schiff. 
What are all the different things? It reads all kinds of stuff. Why would I want to know that except for to make me more grossed out and scared? I know. Because there's mites everywhere. Do you guys know that? Yes, that's yeah. why that's why it's showing. No, no. Well, wouldn't you want to know if you had a, like way more than usual? Hold on a second. Did you really I know, don't know that? I want to know. Do you really know that there's microscopic mites? Yes. In your eyelashes? Yeah, yeah. No, I know. That. They literally live yeah. in your fucking eyelashes right now. Little bugs. Yeah. Probably shower twice a day. Out. Sometimes too. you ain't getting no mites out of your eye <laughs> eyelashes. You got long eyelashes too. Whatever. It's a good you time warm... for a Caldera commercial right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> that's not our sponsor. Stop it. <laughs> Wow, so that breaks down everything that's coming yeah, up. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that fascinating? You seen that, Doug? Yeah, I see it. Uh, Do you think it's cool? Well, it's cool, but why would I care? I mean, oh, you don't care? I don't care. Yeah. I mean, I what don't want to know. So this goes past like sort of the visible uh, <clears throat> spec. So it'll it'll actually like take all the little microbes and all that. And, break and it down? Break it down. What if you're like, your kids had a party and you're like cleaning up and it's yeah. like 12% cocaine. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. What? No, it tells you like what kind of <laughs> substances. Like you're just so. What is it? What are those four categories? What does it say? I'm not sure. I mean, it looks like mites. It looks like viruses. It looks like I don't know bacteria. Dust? That's bacteria. Bacteria, yeah. bacteria. I, and mold. mold. I think it's bacteria, mold, virus. I know that's a I mean, virus. I know why they're doing this, right? Because everybody's a freaking hypochondriac now because of the last couple of years. Yeah, I think it's clever marketing. You I know, did. you know what this I might did. actually do. Let's think of human behavior for a second. Now let's and now Adam is probably the most dysfunctional with this in the sense <laughs> that he wants things to be spotless. Yeah, I bet this would encourage Adam to be even more cleaning shit up oh yeah, yeah it's, it's like pretty. clean but then you go uh, it's not dyson clean yeah yeah, yeah. no it would it totally because right you would want you know what i'd want to do is improve the percentages <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> say, we had honey 75 percent mites yeah, last yeah. week yeah, every time down to 45 yeah. every time your brother's over here and, yeah, i know exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah. where he is <laughs> it's, it's, it's a smelly <laughs> ass i picked up four toenails yeah. are you um did you buy one i did it i just i literally just saw this you're gonna buy one i might i might i might uh, How I much is I, it? I can't admit that it's I like eight hundred bucks. So. Eight hundred uh, bucks? That's yeah. Adam. One hundred percent. I guarantee. Uh, yeah. Do you have a good vacuum at home? Uh, I don't even have a vacuum. Oh, because you have house, housekeepers yeah, 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 coming yeah. clean so, or whatever. Yeah, I don't. I, you know what? We might we might have one in there. I think I have. I think I have. One have you guys there. ever had a door to door vacuum sales guy uh, come to your house? Used to do that vacuum they, sales they, they guy? No. Oh yeah, rainbow vacuums. Rainbows, yeah. Rainbows used to do that. That was a hustle for them. The My mom that, worked for them for a while. We had le le it used Lux, to be something Lux, thousand to fifteen hundred dollars for those vacuums. By the way, bro, they they wow. those sales guys. Can I say something right now? Yeah. The sales guys that sold those vacuums were some of the best closers you'll find anywhere in the world. In the eighties, they were. Like in the 80s, a leave. vacuum sales guy is what we would consider like like the gym sales. Yeah. It's like being like- And you know how much money some of them made? Yeah, big, I, big money. I, I knew a guy in the 90s, okay, who used to sell vacuums and I made fun of him. Like, you sell vacuums? Yeah. Show me his check. I was making 15 grand a month. Selling vacuums. Well, you okay? You know how you know you know how uh, you know quote unquote uh, poor we were or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> right? We had one of those thousand dollar <laughs> vacuums because the rainbow. Yeah, yeah because That's somebody, why you were poor. Somebody so much. You know, you know what it did. What they used to do is they'd they come in and throw dirt. Yeah, on the they floor. throw all yeah. kinds of like shit on your floor, and you're like ah, uh, and then they they clean it all up, and you. So like, what they Whoa. used to. So the, one of their techniques, which was wow. brilliant. And by the way, in the early days, they that had the spinning. Wa they used to have a spinning mm -hmm. water in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, yeah. You back in the day, my grandma had one. Back in the day, by the way, this was an early tactic this is true now you would open the door and they wouldn't even ask you they'd fucking throw dirt on your floor <laughs> throw it in there they would, they would i swear to god oh, they throw dirt the and they say don't worry face. don't worry i'm going to clean your floors for you for free and then and then and now later on they would ask you for permission and then what they would do is they would have you grab your vacuum you get your vacuum and oh, you vacuum it up yeah. then yeah. they use their vacuum be like and then the water in the yeah. vacuum or whatever would get all dirty be like yeah. look how much you yeah. missed hold on a sec get your minivan and run this over <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Still intact. <laughs> hey, why yeah. is it that all those infomercials yeah. <laughs> would run shit over with a They always car? run it over. They explode it. <laughs> yeah. They like, drive it off a cliff. Yeah. It yeah. still works. It's still. <laughs> Who's doing this? Indestructible. <laughs> Who's running over a vacuum? Like, this way. guy is like a blowtorch. <laughs> yeah. It still works. <laughs> wow, man. That's a badass vacuum. And that, and I don't know. I thought that was really, I thought that was funny. It's okay. I have, two, I have two things that I thought were kind of neat yeah. like that. Do right? you know the Fuller Brush guy? The full, you, fuller brush guy. There'd be people go around door to door and they would sell like brushes and spatulas and things like that. Oh, when, no, I don't remember that. Doug, yeah. When you were a young kid, the Mary big, Kay stuff. The two, big, the two big hardcore sales people I remember in the 80s were uh, Rainbow Vacuums mm -hmm. and World Book. Oh, oh yeah, the yeah, encyclopedias. World Book encyclopedias were like, we sell by all of them. Yeah, uh, all for of them. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I still have them. Yeah, I think I my, mom had, my, my mom has all of them too. So I, we had I was taught on the child books and World yeah, Book. So yeah, so we yeah. had two or had three Britannica, dude, big so. bookshelves filled with uh, encyclopedias that my mom paid expensive, right? A lot of money for. Yeah. 
And then every year they would send a new one because it would be a review of the previous year. Yeah. I love, I used to sit down. I mean, I know I've told this before. I'd sit down and I'd take a letter, you know, like, you know, B through D and I'd sit down and I'd just read the encyclopedia and just learn random shit about it. So it was so cool. Yeah. yeah. I had a good time. Well, you know, the, the, the kids version of it were, I don't know if that's the one you started on or not, but the kid ones were cool. They had like pictures yes. and examples. I had of, the Snoopy ones when I was a real kid. So I was like seven or eight. I yeah. would read the Snoopy encyclopedia. But those, those door to door salespeople on, I vividly remember like how aggressive they were and how often they would come around, you know, yeah. and eventually, Oh, we already have it. Yeah. They were, <laughs> we we had a window. We need a like second that. one. They were yeah. closers. <laughs> Bro, I got to say right now, yeah. the, the brain blend from Ned is fire. Fire. Oh, fire. Yeah. That was whoever helped him come I'm up with the formulation. I'm anticipating the next time I get my hands on it, dude. <laughs> Opportunity to stroke himself I off know. Race. No, it's, uh, listen. <laughs> whoever was behind that. I don't know. Brother. Whoever advised that. No, I, so I, I got the ingredients right here. So a single serving or a dropper full is 12.5 milligrams of CBD, 12.5 milligrams of CBG, which has got brain boosting effects. And then there's other it's cannabinoids. It's the gangster version. Then it also has uh, ginkgo. So ginkgo helps with blood flow to the brain. Go to cola, which is a mild stimulant. Bacopa, which also does uh, uh, blood flow to the brain. Siberian ginseng. It's got brain health effects. It's also kind of a mild uh, adaptogen. Lion's mane. We know that as well as, a, uh, as being a, another nootropic. Anyway... Fire! You take this. You, I swear to God, people listening right yeah, now, I you concur. Got, you got something creative, or you got to go to a party. Take it before you go to the party and watch what happens. It is you watch feel, the crowd form in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be able to just tell them <laughs> things you learn in encyclopedias <laughs> all day. That's so, it's crazy. That's never happened. You did like you, you, <laughs> you just you, hold you, court like yeah. me. It's weird. That actually yeah. happened once. Doug and I went to this internet marketing uh, convention years when we first started with Maps Anabolic, and we went to this party. And I remember at one point I started talking about, I don't remember what I was talking about supplements. And there was like, people were kind of coming around, sitting around, and Doug's in the back smiling. He's like, yeah, yeah. Gonna we're going to make it. Tell you Doug's like, oh, <laughs> Doug's like, oh, I want to make millions off this guy. <laughs> I, just, I just put a quarter in him and turned him on. Yeah. He's like, let him go. <laughs> yeah. It's a good uh, yeah, Anyway, that, all right. So we have to talk about uh, Andrew Tate. Oh. Yes. Andrew Tate. Yesterday. So he was on, hold on. He was on. Wait, uh, wait, wait. I okay. get to set the table. This still I get to set the table you because I brought it to you. It's you only did. fair. You did. It's only fair. You did. Well, actually, no, let me back up. Andrew brought Andrew Tate to me first. Mm. So about three weeks ago. Our YouTube producer. Andrew, our YouTube fan. producer, Andrew, Andrew goes, hey, have you, uh, we should get Andrew Tate on the show. And I'm like, who the fuck is that? I don't know who he is at this time. Yeah. Oh, it was a long time ago. Yeah. So this is like a month ago or so. And uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, you should, you should check him out. And so I started going through his clip. Okay. And. Honest to God, my response was, nah, this is not somebody I want on the show. And, I, and I'd and i only probably consumed some of his reels and TikToks and things like that. But you know how the algorithms work. Once I clicked on some of his stuff, now I'm getting fed all yeah, his, yeah. his stuff. So eventually, I go down the rabbit hole, watch a few things. He says a few things that I agree with. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll listen to this guy a little bit. So eventually, I end up listening to a few interviews, and I actually end up liking a, a lot of his content. But I know he's extremely controversial. So now I become interested and what he has to say, I know Patrick Bet David has a big interview, I believe, and I don't know if this is public knowledge, if I can share this or not, but I won't say where it came from, so I'm going to go ahead and share it. So I, I heard that uh, 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 PBD paid him a quarter million to half a million dollars for that interview. Hmm. So That and they, makes sense. Yeah, and I think they met in Miami, and they had this, because Andrew Tate's like all over the place. Yeah. And they met and had like a five-hour interview. Now, I'm not all the way through, but I'm, I'm like three-something hours into it, and I was really... because. Sal and I got into an argument yeah. about him. Big he, argument. Yeah, well, so. yeah, it kind of started. And I kind of had the same perception that Sal had going into it. Too. It was like, because the perception out there uh, is that, you know, they take little clips of what he's been saying and he sounds very misogynistic. He sounds very um, arrogant. Arrogant. Yeah, exactly. Very boisterous. Like, so immediately, too, like, and you guys know this, anybody that's charismatic and is that. Um, you know, confident. I usually try and cut them down right away. Yep. So that's, uh, I was like, I don't know, but I, I started to kind of watch into the content to get a little better understanding of what message he's putting yeah. out. Well, there. I mean, make no mistake. He is an egomaniac. <clears throat> yeah. He is a hundred percent. And he definitely comes across as a douchebag and an asshole. So yeah. that's, that's make no mistake. I think that's, I don't think anybody can argue that, right? No, I don't think any of us would argue that, but what I, I mean, he's not what, somebody I would but, like. But what I will on. say towards that is, all four of us in this room were rated high on the narcissistic test. Mm. And ego is also a not, it's not a purely negative thing. Their ego is a very positive thing too. So. Oh yeah. You know his, but his, his, his definitely, self -belief. Yeah. I don't know the guy personally. His definitely comes across as uh 
dysfunctional. There's a dysfunctional level of narcissism, and he definitely comes across that way. But here's the thing that I that I came up because I'm, I'm watching it, and I've seen some of his content. I don't like the guy, but here's here's what I'm going to say, and this is where I think things get interesting. I think right now, and and this happened with uh, former President Donald Trump too. There's a shell game that's being played with us, and here's what the game is. The game is that somebody gets kicked off the internet. Okay, and we'll get to that. Okay, what happened to Andrew Tate? Same thing that happened to Donald Trump. And then the then the the narrative that gets promoted is did did he deserve it? Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? And everybody argues and debates about that. Oh, Donald Trump deserves to to, to be on social media. Other people, no, he stoked the the flames of the January sixth insurrection. Oh, he's this. Oh, he's that. Same thing with Andrew Tate. No, he's good. He says the truth. Mm -hmm. No, he's an asshole. He's misogynistic. He's back and forth. This is not the conversation. This is a shell game. Here's the conversation. How in the hell, how in the hell did all of these extremely competitive big tech companies who otherwise kill each other for followers and money, literally, Meta would crush Twitter if they could. They would crush all these other social media platforms, yeah, YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. They fight over audiences constantly. They are mm -hmm. extremely competitive, one of the most competitive markets in the world. How did all of them, and it turns out much more, Uber, Stripe, um, Gmail, how did all these tech companies that compete so aggressively simultaneously Mm -hmm. erase someone off the internet. So I'm glad you went that way because yeah. it, so op it opens the door for me to to concede our mm. previous argument. Okay, so I think I gave you shit yeah. and Justin's shit with your tinfoil hats. With the conspiracy, which is that just, the, that we're the, just paying attention. That the government's out to do all this stuff. But after listening to how coordinated that was, and all these all these other companies, like yeah, Uber, I mean, yeah. Uber no, kicked them off. There's no rhyme or reason to it other than, yeah. Well, I mean. It's orchestrated. So my thought, the way I argued it last time was like, you don't think that a couple of these tech guys come to it, but you're talking about bank accounts. You're talking about Uber. Banks you're kicked about them out. Gmail. You're yes. talking, now that's. There, that, it, that is way too coordinated now. I, I mean, now, I, I was diving into his content because I'm like, what is so dangerous about this individual that has, you know, government and has like a big companies like so threatened by this guy? Yeah. Well, what you need to, there's two things that you need to understand before we continue with this because someone listening is like, what's that doesn't make sense. And I, I talked to my son about this because my son's in the age group of kids that listen to this guy. My son's not a fan. Um, but I said, hey, I want you to listen to this interview. And this specific part about all the things that kicked them off and how so him and I got into this discussion and he's like, Dad, why why would why would government care? How can they do that? That's not legal. Okay, here's the deal. Post 9-11, this is true. We passed legislation. Look at the Patriot Act and look at uh, not the National Defense Authorization Act. Those are two more specific ones, but there's more legislation after that. Okay, but those two specific ones that were passed post 9-11 allow give the power to the government to literally, if they think you're a threat to national security, they don't have to go to a judge, a trial, a jury. They don't have to get a warrant. Mm -hmm. they, could, they, could, they could go through your stuff. They could go through your house. They can in label fact, you a terrorist in and fact, just erase you. In fact, non -defense, the National Defense Authorization Act allows the government, in writing, they could come to you, throw you in jail in Guantanamo Bay, tell no one, and keep you there forever. Mm -hmm. No judge, no trial, no jury. That's in the legislation. So this legislation gives the power of the government, if they view someone as a national security threat, then what they could do is they could go to these companies and compel them. And maybe they don't go to these companies and say, you better do this or we're going to whatever, but maybe you're the CEO of, of, of YouTube and the head of the CIA shows up or FBI says, hey, you know, we think this guy's a national security threat. We really, we really advise that you guys kick him off and we want you to do it on this date. We think it's a good idea. Now, if you're the CEO and you're getting visited by the CIA, yeah. you're probably going to be like, either A, you believe them. You're like, I want to help. Mm -hmm. Or B, you're like, I better fucking do what they say. Yeah. And if you don't do what they say, what could potentially follow Yeah, you're is the target now. Mm -hmm. Not only be a target, but they can say, hey, by the way, we could fine you. <clears throat> we could shut you down. And we could also deny it. And you can't take us to court. This is in legislation. This is the law of the land. So I think that's what happened because no way, yeah, never in what history. Zuckerberg described. He said the same. He said it. Never in history have competing companies in a free market yeah, so readily left money on the table. Because if you're, look at, if you're YouTube and Meta kicks Andrew Tate off, and this is the most searched man on the internet, and you're YouTube, I'm, if I'm the CEO of YouTube, I'm like, hell yeah. Now all those people are going to come over here. He's going to make so much more money. We're going to make so much more money. This is going to be great. But no, they all did this simultaneously. Yeah. And instead, what we're arguing over is, 
is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Is he whatever? I don't give a shit what he says. He has a right to say it. And yes, these are private company. And so what essentially what's happened is the because of that legislation, the government now can impose tyranny by proxy. Mm -hmm. They basically skirted the constitution because they can't do it themselves. The government can't can't silence you. Yeah. Right. right? But the government can use a private company and the private company can do it. And then you could try to sue the company the and work have around. Whole, yes. Now the irony of all of this is that and, and you brought this up off air yesterday and, and I 100% agree with this is you actually, and this is where the government is stupid is you just made him more powerful. Mm -hmm. He literally went to rumble. He's a martyr now. He went to mm -hmm. rumble and what took him five to seven years to build a following on YouTube. Yep. He almost already surpassed that. He definitely has more eyes on him on rumble. Like, cause he was being shadow banned forever. He's like one yeah. of his, so and it was still growing. Right. Just despite that. He goes over to Rumble, blows up immediately, and yeah. has way more eyeballs on him than he had before. And now everybody is seeking him. Now all the all the stuff in my Explorer page. So even though his Instagram is other blocked, people are posting anybody shit. that's posting stuff of his stuff is going viral all over the place. And so they literally just made him. If their if your desired outcome was to shoot shoot him down and hurt him and like right. shut him up, like you literally just gave this guy. You, what way you've more done power. is you've taken his base of fans. Look at Donald Trump for example. Right, made he him got, more radical. What, and this, and this, but what happened to Donald Trump was crazy. He got simultaneously kicked off all platforms. Got picked up by another platform called Parler, who's like, we're gonna have you on. And then what they did is the servers that hosted Parler kicked them off mm -hmm. and the app companies kicked them off. That was very strange. When that all happened, I was like, oh my gosh, this isn't good. But what happened to Donald Trump's most hardcore, his base, they became more, more solid. More entrenched with that. Yeah. Because now he's this savior. Everyone's against him. You know, all these people, Andrew Tate. See, he's right about the matrix, how he talks about the matrix. Right, he's right. Q and on and all these things happen. It's, it's, like it's such a stupid, what you need to do is let him do his thing <clears throat> and then have people debate him. Have yeah, people with better ideas. Him. Compete and then if he breaks his ideas, it's yeah, it's the thing. We need that competition of ideas and be able to have discord and discuss these things. Yes, and and if he do, and if he breaks the law, then go after him. Yeah. If he does incite violence or he does do something like slander or whatever, yeah. there's laws. This is the danger of censorship. I felt I've it was what I was really in a, in how we got into such a heat about him. Why I was passionately defending his character, even though I don't really truly know the guy, was because I went through the same story arc I feel like that you both went through I just went through it first where I felt the same way I didn't like him at first but then I also had to check myself and go like you know what I've been mainly consuming his content in 90 second bits 15 second bits out of context yeah so. out of context mm -hmm. and I haven't truly listened to this guy explain his points yeah. and these these misogynistic comments that he's making right. and in the in the the Patrick Bed David interview he does that and he addresses every single thing like Patrick Bed David was great literally wrote every quote that he's been destroyed for. What he, the what he does that's, that I think is bad, the reason why I don't like him, and I have, I've only heard maybe, a, maybe well, now I've heard probably five hours of his content because I listened to two hours of the interview and I've listened <laughs> to maybe two or three hours of other stuff. What he does that I think is bad is the way he communicates, how he comes across, the way he presents masculinity, which is machismo, uh, this, this, this like loud and out there bravado. Yeah which is not real masculine confidence. Like if you've ever met a really confident man, they're, they're secure. They don't, yeah. they're don't. they not the it's loud not, one at the bar. Act. Yeah, they're right. not the loud one at the bar banging their chest yeah. and telling you. They're the yeah. one that's cool. Like, I've hung out with people like that. I, remember, I had a buddy who was an MMA fighter and I remember somebody trying to throw a drink on him and he was so cool about it. And mm -hmm. I, I remember being like, man, what a confident guy. Because You know, I, I in... In in his defense on that, he actually gets into uh, that towards about the three hour mark of the interview, and it's probably how he grew up. I'm sure that's part of. Well, yeah, his, I mean, there's I definitely think he a, does it to hack the, the he algorithms. Does. Right? A lot of a lot of the stuff he he says and does, he knows he's kind of fucking with people yeah. because he knows he's getting in their head. He's getting he's making them emotional, and he's like, that's the way that he's playing chess with them in a yeah. sense. And then, but okay, that doesn't justify completely, and it still doesn't combat your point but yeah. what i where i do understand a little bit or or i think i uh or where i'm defending him now is that he has had become aware of that 
in the in just recent time in the last few months and he said you know leading so up to my to change it yeah he says in the leading up to the last three months before i was banned my team and i were sitting down and we were taking that into consideration even though this strategically this is smart for me to do all this stuff like that i'm also impacting a 15 year old boy that may be consuming this content in such a short form that he's yeah. going to take that the wrong way and that is not my desired see outcome. that's how i, I put right. myself in, in that and i'm proud because my son is that target audience yeah. of his and my son doesn't like him for the same exact reason it's a very impressionable uh, demographic and, and that's because my son has a good relationship with me so yes. i'm a good i think that's that's what i would guess and i'm a good a, a better example of that mm -hmm. now if i were a 15 year old 16 year old boy i don't have a good male role model mm -hmm. where i grew up really hard oh 100, and 100 i would be i would look yeah, at this guy 100 totally that's why i'm like drawn to firing it. you yeah. up I, I didn't have a i didn't have a dad role figure like that in my life and i have that edge to me as a kid yeah. and if you if i was 12. So you can identify with it. Yeah, so I could totally identify with him. When I was 12 years old, I would be drawn to that. I would totally, I could totally say it. And, I, and you're 100% spot on. The answer to someone as Andrew Tate, if you don't like the way he's delivering that message, because I don't disagree with a lot of things he says, is to be a better father, to be a better role model. Yeah. You know, to take the things that he's saying and be able to deliver yeah, it to your son. son. That's, that's not what masculinity is. Right, right. You know? right. Now, now I, and I, look, some of the stuff he says is wrong, by the way. He said something about women being worse drivers and then the... And then the what's his name said, well, you know, they get less accident. Well, because men drive more. That's not that's not true. Insurance companies do a really good job of calculating risk, and men get into more fatal and more terrible accidents because more bigger risk takers. So he tends to go wrong because he wants so hard to defend men all the time. But the, here's another underlying part of this, besides the most important part, which I think is mm -hmm. we need we all all of us need to be very alarmed that they could erase someone from the internet, from these private companies, mm -hmm. and they can do so seemingly with impunity. That's a very dangerous precedent. That means that they could direct speech and silent speech. And the most the most important freedom that we have that's protected is speech. That's my yeah. strongest opinion. And I think that's the opinion of a lot of people who are experts on this. But uh, I, the, the, what I think about the guy in this particular sense is I think he's a reaction. I think his popularity, mm -hmm. the reason why he's popular is because a lot of these kids, a lot of these boys, especially these boys without good role, male role models, keep hearing about how their masculinity is toxic. Yep. They keep hearing about how they're privileged if they're white, even though, man, I don't have parents and I'm poor. I keep being told, they keep being told how men are this, men are that, you're this. And men don't have uh, a role in society like they did in the past where men had kind of clear defined mm -hmm. roles. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, it's just you, you're kind of trying to find yourself. And so it's like, it's a reaction. Like I keep being told that I'm toxic. I keep being told I'm privileged. I don't feel privileged. I keep being told all these things. And then here's this guy on there telling you, you're great, pick yourself up, bust your ass, stop crying, be a man, whatever. And it's a very appealing message because it's on the opposite side and it makes you feel more empowered. Well, it makes you so feel strong. The the part that the, the the inner struggle that I have with like, you know, you know, coming out with like a decision on how do I feel about this guy, right? Like how do I feel about his content? And he went in pretty hard on Logan Paul, who actually I've speak positively about. Like I think Logan, his points on Logan were on point though. They were very on point. Yeah, and right. it actually made me think a little bit. Like, you know, who is better for our society gaining all this attention and stuff like that? Is is Andrew Tate or Logan Paul better for my teenage, like my boy's mm -hmm. not a teenager yet, but if he was a teenage boy, mm -hmm. would I be more concerned about him, like a massive Logan Paul follower and paying attention to all his stuff? Or would I be more concerned about him? Wow, think, that's play, a good point. Think about that for a second. Yeah, because I feel like it would start great conversations. I think it would it would challenge your, maybe some of your son's beliefs or, but whereas Logan Paul's like entertainment at Goofy, you know, you know, follow, follow the, whatever the, yeah. the norm, you yeah. know, wherever the wind blows, he, he doesn't stand up for anything that he believes yeah. in flip flops on some of the stuff that he said in the past. Yeah. Like, man, I, 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 and I think I would rather have someone like Andrew Tate, who's delivering a message that I agree with a good percentage of it, but I don't agree with the way he's delivering yeah. it. And then I can have that deeper conversation with my son, like, well, son, yeah, there's some things that he's saying that are true and I like, but you don't want to come off this way for these reasons yeah. and, and, and then be a, versus him just blindly following some kid who's an entertainer. It's, what it is is, mm. and we talk about this all the time, it's not just what you're trying to communicate, but it's also how it's you how communicate you it. it. Yeah. And how you communicate it makes a big deal. For example, he, he talked about, and this is a very, you know, for sensitive listeners, I mean, this, is, this actually happened. He got in a debate with a feminist and the feminist was like, we need to teach men not to rape. And he's like, men know not to rape. We need to teach women 
to, uh, how to stay safe or be more responsible. And then he uses the example of like, you know, if a woman is in a dark alley late at night and then she gets assaulted, she bears some responsibility because she put herself in that situation. Now, the way he communicates it was shitty. Well, and it comes across really bad. In that context, yes. Yes. He went in deep on that. I know. But my point is the way he initially, the way he tends to communicate it when he goes off. Yeah, yeah. And, and the way I would communicate it to my daughter is I'd say, hey, you need to be safe, be yeah, aware. Yeah. Don't, but I wouldn't be like, if something happened, we're like, you better respond to Because I, 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 he goes he, later, I don't remember how far deep into that, because they actually touched on that twice. Like he briefly went over it. Yeah. And when he was going over the list. And then later on, he goes, I really want to address that because it's one of the ones that bothered me the most. Yeah. Because he, how passionate he says I feel about women yeah. and stuff and what he does for that community. He goes, I, first of all, I intend intentionally did that because it was a feminist, right? So yeah. I wanted to rattle her cage. I knew that would emotionally fucking sure. bomb in her head, right? So he did that intentionally to rattle her cage. And then he goes on to explain in like great detail on what he means by that. And I and I and I I agree with the like the, the sentiment. Messaging. Yeah. Yeah. I, the I, sentiment I, and the messaging that he's trying to teach. It's not it's not at all to say he thinks it's a more dangerous message to be teaching women that like you should be able to walk around naked all you want and actually think that there's not going to be stupid men that will always be I think, around. Like I think a, the, you would never want to teach your daughter. The most that. effective thing you can do, There's in my opinion, predators out there. Yes, my, the most effective thing you could do is to teach men to protect women in situations like that. I think that's smart, mm -hmm. and I think to teach women, teach young women, hey, here's situations you probably shouldn't be in, or mm -hmm. here's a if you go out, take a friend. If you're going to go on a date with a, a guy that you met on Tinder or on a dating app, tell your friends where you're going to be at, share your location, communicate to them what's going on, let them know what car he's driving. Like that kind of stuff I think is, or carry a gun if there, if you live in a state where you could do concealed carry or yeah, carry a gun his, in your purse. His, like, his point that I think is, is so, is so true is like, man, I'm not going to tell my daughter that, you know, oh, it's, you know, let me, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to make sure I get messaging around to tell these guys that, you know, to be yeah. better. Like yeah. he goes, that's, that, there's no world that exists like that where there's going to be perfect men that respect that. There's yeah. always going to be evil and bad and all these things like that. So I'm going to, I'm going to educate my daughter on being safe totally. and smart and doing this. And right now that's not the messaging. The messaging is she should be able to do whatever she wants and men need to not do. And it's like, that isn't, that's a danger. He goes, that's more dangerous than what I'm trying to say. Yeah, right I, now. So I have a friend, this is true. This is a true story. I have a friend whose daughter had just turned 21 and he was very good about this. He would teach his daughter, watch out for this, watch out for that. Make sure you're in these situations. Make sure you're not in these situations. And he taught her, this was years ago. He said, never leave your drink at the bar mm -hmm. unattended. Yep. Keep your hand on top of it at it's all like times. It's like the cardinal rule. I mean, okay. This bartender, so she was, she was doing that. Yeah. So she was very safe about it. Her friend wasn't because she was you know, 21 and oh, I'm having fun or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she saw a guy slip something in her drink. Dude, this she happens actually caught way that. more often than people realize. Yes. Yeah, it's, yes. It's a real problem. It's a real, but I mean, thankfully because he taught his daughter this yeah. and of course you got to be careful. You don't want your kid to walk around scared of life, right? but you just make them aware and say, Hey, just keep your hand on your drink. Well, and, I, and I think this idea of us shaming the guys that are doing evil and bad things like that is a losing battle. Yeah, good luck. They don't give a shit. No, those right. are evil people. And even even if you improve that by all the messaging, all the shaming, Look, all the I, you're you're never going to eliminate if it. If you want to do something to them, I think uh sexual assault, violence um against other people should be the the most the worst punishable offenses in the law. I think it's crazy that Drums, Someone get caught higher, right? carrying, you know, you know, fifteen hits of acid in particular states will get more time right. than a guy that physically assaults a, a woman. I think that's insane. I think All if right. you physically assault someone or sexual assault, it should be the biggest punishment I by agree. far, I especially agree. if you're in a position of power. It, yeah, but, especially. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's controversial. I know. Right Actually, anyway. did you hear him break down the, the, his whole? Because one of the things he gets in trouble for is saying that he'd rather live in a lawless place like Romania. That one I disagree with. I, I know where his point was and how he plays. Oh, I chess. totally don't disagree with that. I totally think that's a great point. No, you I don't. don't what, what do you? I know because my, you know, Sicily and my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation was like that. And, and, and it's not, you don't want to live in a place like that. I know what he said. He said in a place like that where I wouldn't, corruption is more available to the masses, yes, what he said. Yeah. But the reality is that people with more money still have more power. They still well, are able to corrupt. So, okay. So he clarifies that like as who he is and he's setting his. Maybe so, for him because he's yeah, a millionaire. Yeah, because he's a hundred millionaire. Yeah. And he, so he can, he can pay off. You know, he could pull over and have alcohol in his breath. He could easily drop $10,000 to the cop. You know, and cop will be, let him go. And cop will let him go. Yeah. 
So yes, I agree. If you're a normal person, I would not. I would want to live in a more protected. But if I'm at his level, where I've got it private kind of made, jets, and I, I can see his point. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, so I don't disagree with that. I mean, I think yeah. that's a fair, a fair point to make. Though. Yeah, I could totally see. It. Yeah. Anyway, I want to hear your what you were going to say about Ty Cobb. Oh yeah, and his dentures. Yes. Yeah, so Ty Cobb's dentures. Now, wasn't he the first? Was he the first baseball card, or was he the most valuable baseball card? I think he's the most first, valuable. Yeah. I don't know if he's the most valuable. I, I thought he was the most valuable baseball card. I, of Mickey all time. Mantle's card, Mickey it might Mantle be more. That's Babe a good Ruth. question. I don't know. I think, yeah, I think Mickey Mantle's baseball card is one of the most expensive. Yeah, uh, maybe Doug can look up the most. Ty Cobb, Ty Cobb is up there, 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he was the sure. first, he was one of the first big, like, baseball stars, right? Yeah, yeah. He's up. Yeah, I, you know, boy, you're going to challenge me on, like, <laughs> exact year and stuff like that. Everybody is. And who came first? I, I couldn't okay. tell you that. Um, but anyways, yes, yes, famous, uh, absolutely famous baseball player. His dentures were just auctioned off for $18,000. I just wow. thought that was so rare. Like, who wants those? I know. It's <laughs> Bro, if you're a hardcore baseball fan. <laughs> that's just so weird, this though. This does nothing to do with baseball, though. I, you know, like, to me, that's where the obsessive fandom is like, dude, calm down. Like, what are you going to get? Like, you know, his underwear or something like <laughs> Like, how personal do you need to get to these, like, I get sports that. stars? And not only that, dude, doesn't even display well. Like, I, so I'm, I'm guilty. I know, having, I'm guilty of, like, you know, signed jerseys and stuff like that hanging up in my... <laughs> but, I mean, that looks cool on the wall. You know what I'm saying? It's decorative. It's, it's not like, like Dennis Robinson's yeah, sock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like sock. You know, Mike Tyson's uh, Q-tip. Yeah, so, Mickey Mantle is the most expensive, right? Oh, it was? Yeah, yeah. So It's I, a I, record. Oh, yeah. What was Ty Cobb's for? And Actually, let's look up Ty Cobb. When did he play? Was it the... It yeah, was uh, in the early... 1900s. Wow. You know what's crazy about baseball back then? I'm not a huge, obviously, I don't know a lot about sports, but I do know this. Back in those days, those guys smoked and drank. Oh, and yeah. They, they partied. Just, they didn't really crack. Yeah, they yeah. didn't work out. Well, they remember, up. remember Babe Ruth was a slob, you know, professional dude. sports back then. You couldn't make any money doing it. Oh, yeah. So everybody still, you had a, it was like a pickup game. It's like us, it would be like us playing uh, softball. Yeah. You, know, you still have a real job while everybody drinks, smokes, and plays softball. Still, wow. like you don't, you didn't take it seriously like a profession, you know? Wow. Okay. So he he was uh wow. Look at that. He hit three twenty or better for twenty two consecutive seasons. That's pretty damn good. Yeah. That's crazy. So Ty Cobb is 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 actually quite a bit before him. Oh, I yeah. should have known. He that. was he was nineteen oh seven and nineteen fifteen. I didn't, real, I didn't realize so, how far before. So um, wow. So okay. So with football back in the days, did each player? play both offense and defense? Was that originally how it was played? Yes. Yeah. What do they call it? Iron Man? Or am I, am I making up a word? What's the word for that kind of style of football? Um, I don't know about that. Uh, both ways is yeah, what you, you say. Just, like, yeah, yeah, I play I both. In high school, they still do that. Both ways, but... Like in high school, that's still common. Wow. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if you have players that do that. Um, yeah. You oh, only yeah. have like 23 guys. Yeah. So in high school, to. in high school, that's still really... That sucks. That's still it's really common worst. in high school. You go both... You play multiple That's when you're really you depleted. Plays. Yeah. Your program's really depleted and you only have so many people like yeah. showing up. Dude, you have to do It's not until college. College is when you... Yeah. I played both ways for a while. It was my JV year and... Is that exhausting? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, dude, it was brutal. What'd you play on offense? I played, uh, I played guard and a little bit of. You uh, did guard, tight end. yeah. Really? Yeah, I hated it. I, I, I didn't like anything about offense, so they never really put. You me just wanted in. to hit people. Yeah, I just hit people, <laughs> and so like during practice, for the most part, I would like wait, and then they'd finally let me uh, just be on scout D, and I'd go against the first team offense and, and bang them up. You know, because it was just, I don't know why, but it just, for some reason, I was only there literally to hit people. Like, I was just had this, like... You're like, I don't want to learn all these plays and calls and fucking... Yeah, I'm like, you know, it's just all fancy stuff. Justin I mean, found a less. Just tell me who to hit. How yeah. Can I, how can I smash I was like water boy out trouble. there. <laughs> <laughs> just would run as hard as I could and smash wow. your face. Wow. Hey, yeah. um, did you guys hear... Uh, do you guys know who Bill Pearl is? Powerlifter guy? No, bodybuilder. Doug, oh, look bodybuilder him up. Guy. Oh, right. So I want you guys to look at this bodybuilder because he was, this was before. Isn't he the one with the, the, the round barbell? No, 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 oh. no. You're thinking Eugene Sandow. Oh. Okay, so Bill Pearl was one of the bodybuilders that um, inspired Arnold Schwarzenegger. Was he a so black guy? That's how, uh, no, Native American and white. Okay. So look at oh, some of his old pictures, Doug, where he's flexing. That one in the middle there in color, because uh, that, that one on the very left is when he was in his 50s. But look at the size of this guy back in- uh, Oh, wow. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But, but there was a color picture that you could really see. Well, that one right there, he looks incredible. The, the, that, middle, that middle one right there. Okay, so- Look at his waist and his chest and shoulder. Right? Yes. What years was he bodybuilding? Doug? 1975. No, right no, no, no. He was, I mean, he was in the 70s when he was older, but I'm talking about during his prime. When he, that one right there. Look, look, go down. Keep going. There you go on the very left. I mean, look at this guy. He was a he was a beat. 1967. So that's towards the end of his career. So 50s and 60s was Bill Pearl. 
And this is when, I mean, they either took a little bit of steroids or no steroids, 20 something in charms. I mean, this guy was incredible. So strong. I think he, I think he was one of the first bodybuilders bench press. I want to say 500 pounds. Anyway, uh, he just passed away. 91 years old. Oh, he did. Uh, yeah. 91, huh? 91. I mean, that's a total good long... icon. Yeah. He was, this is like a, a big time bodybuilding icon. One of the greatest of the of. The so sports. when you see someone like that, and he made it all the way to ninety one, probably relatively healthy dude. I think he died of Parkinson's actually. Oh, did yeah, you really? yeah, yeah. So, do you think a lot of these early deaths that we see in in bodybuilding, do you think a lot of it's contributed to all the drugs? To the the ones that you like start to see, because yeah, you don't see that with bodybuilders and from the. And all that. You don't see that from bodybuilders uh, up until the eighties. It was say, when they got to the nineties. We have more eighties yeah. and nineties guys dying or we're more 90s and 2000 yes. guys dying than we have like 70s and 80s guys yes going, like right? guys from the 70s 50s 60s 70s 80s typically make it to their late 70s early 80s or 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 beyond the 90s is when it got really crazy with the drugs and stuff so i have to assume that's probably now what, what, what people like uh what's his name derek from uh, more place more dates i really like a lot of his content he does he, he tends to defend the anabolics and 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 would probably say that it's less due to the actual anabolics and more due to just the the stress on the organs. Forcing the body to yeah. grow. and yeah. Probably, I mean, but that's an effect that they're looking for. Yeah. Um, you know, it could be. But they don't just use, you know, anabolic steroids. They no, use they're using all kinds of different- Insulin and, and All kinds hormone. of different stuff. But I mean, yeah. I mean, we've got a lot of stuff on that and they've did, we did, we've tested. And I feel like it's less about the drugs and it's more about- the size of the body. The, it's like it's almost like you're making your Constantly body pressing it instead of recovering. Yeah, it. think about the food you have to eat, and how yeah. much you push your body. Um, yeah, it is interesting. I don't know because we have zero studies on those doses of anabolics. We have the high, the best, the highest dose study that we have was on testosterone, and it went up as high as 600 milligrams, which is a that's like a decent. Oh, yeah, that's a big yeah. dose. You know, that's a decent bodybuilder beginner. That's not a pro bodybuilder dose, but like a beginner. You know, what, what a guy may take when he first starts or whatever is bodybuilder. And in that, they showed it was pretty safe. But these guys are taking all kinds of other yeah. shit, not just testosterone, but a bunch of other things. So, so this is a, this isn't this is old news, but it's not like old uh, cool sports news or anything. But uh, you guys remember the sex tape from uh, Kim Kardashian uh, back in the day, like with with uh, what's his name, Ray J? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I guess he came out in the news recently and was like. He's talking about um, Chris, I guess is her mom, that uh, he was saying that she had to have gone through and watched like multiple sex tapes between them to decide which one to leak and then like so pass she was that part on of it? to Vivid. Yes. Does he have evidence? And this is because this is all like in the period. Like she wasn't really well known. She was like kind of like Paris Hilton's sidekick back in the day. Because you brought her up the other day and like how this billionaire, you know, yeah. she's just crushing. Right? Yeah. And, uh, but that's how she got her start. But that's like how she got her start was like the, the notoriety because Ray J is a big name back then, I guess. Well, wasn't there like a little moment there where – a lot like after Paris Hilton, stuff like that, where people saw that as a strategy. Both Paris Hilton, uh, mm -hmm. Pamela Anderson, and I mean, a lot of people became famous after their sex yeah. tape. Was yeah. that kind of like a? I think she probably started that trend, right? Yeah, like I, I, I thought I heard it that. stopped working though, right? I think yeah. everybody got sick of it. I Hulk Hogan has a sex tape. That's all. Yeah, I, no, the <laughs> screech. It was all. Yeah. I watched it. It was all. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can you imagine? No, is, <laughs> oh. I mean, was there was like a, a good like ten year run there? It was. Where that was like part of the formula was like go ahead and leak one of your sex tapes and you'll be embarrassed for a week, but then it'll get you all this. So the story morality. is that the mom yeah. did it on purpose to get her daughter her start. Oh my god! Right. How twisted would you? Yeah, well, like how like creepy your mom's like going through like I don't know this one's not good lighting like is it, <laughs> they are <laughs> they're AJ shrewd quite the know, mom is excited enough shrewd business person yeah and you could tell that's like one of her main values right so yeah. Would she do is that? Is she like that? I, I feel I, like I'm not surprised by it. Bro, she's I'm, a business genius. Not, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, she's she manages, the mastermind behind she's that She's managed thing. all the kids. She, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm not, I haven't watched a whole Kardashian I, show. You don't have to watch. I don't, you don't. Like, yeah. I've seen clips. That's yeah, all I need. Don't lie. Yeah. Don't lie. He's a big who me? Yeah. I never watch What's it. What's all her yes, name, so? Did, yes. Huh? I don't even know. My you wife watches. No, too no, much. no. My wife loves. Oh, that's Kardashian. an easy default right yeah. there. I don't. I never watch it's it. I leave the room. On the I TV. leave the room. I, I swear I'm to just God. Just washing the dishes. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't care. Listen, I would say if I watch it, I don't care. But, but uh, I do know through my wife because she knows everything about them. She loves them. Is the mom is like manages them and is like <laughs> huge. Yeah. Oh, you uh, know, like the business genius. You guys just reminded me of something I actually didn't even have in my notes. Doug, could you help me out here? Uh. 
there is uh, a, a Netflix show. It's uh, brand new. It's um, a real estate. Basically, they are completely ripping off of like uh, the the sharks, Shark Tank. Okay. Oh yeah, with and, real but estate? it's with real estate. So they and they have four real estate moguls. Okay. And it, it's literally a bite off a of Shark Tank. They sit them up where there's all four mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. They they pre-interview the home seller, and then the home seller comes in, and then they basically are bidding on the house. Mm -hmm. You know, the they they have a number they want. They go back. What and a forth. great setup for them. It's oh, called I'm, buy my house, yeah. dude. So not selling Sunset. It's a different. No, it one. said buy my house. Yeah, buy my house. Okay. Where did you see it? It was on the. It was when Doug when you went off images, Doug. Yeah, yeah. It's buy my buy my house. So, so you have to present your house to them, and then they <clears throat> they give you offers on it. Yes, yes. So oh. really cool show. Okay. Uh, First of all, it's not as good as Shark Tank. Um, okay. I, I like Shark Tank better from, but because I'm so into the real estate game right now, what I love about it is they actually they obviously they uh, they have curated some of the better areas for investment properties because mm. these are all real estate investors. There's a CEO of Redfin. There's like an ex NFL guy, mm. and then there's like these two girls that are both like big powerhouse investors, and they basically go back and forth. They try and do the cheesy, you know talking shit to each other like shark tank and all that stuff like that but what's really good is they actually take homes in these areas that i've already researched so i'm digging that oh so you can but now the price is what you would like see in that market or are they totally i mean i what i love to do like katrina was watching it with me and so i'd be like oh that house is 740 and see how close i am like i've been like almost dead on really it. yeah yeah oh good for you yeah yeah she's like damn I'm how like, bad do you want to be on a show like that? i do i do, I do. <laughs> I do. so it's cool so if you're into that stuff um i i i enjoy that i enjoy and there's a couple areas now that have actually prompted me to go and do more research on because they weren't on my radar so mm. some of these little towns I, I had already been on 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 the pulse of that and already looking mm -hmm. up stuff for us, but then other ones popped up. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. So now uh, I can find. Some oh, hey, I want to ask you: Do you give um, Max the the Paleo Valley meat sticks? Does he eat those? I have, I have. Oh, okay, yeah, we're all out though. We haven't had any. They haven't sent us in a while. But. So it's it's one of the few, I mean, products or supplements or whatever that we have. Food products. My kids, kids fight over. Yeah, they they I fight bring over. some home to my kids all the time. They love the garlic ones, those those purple ones. Yeah, those both my so daughter good. and my son yeah. fight over them, and they take them and they take them to school. So them. you know what, Matt, Max will actually eat the jalapeno ones. Really? My son likes like spicy stuff. They're not stuff that like, spicy yeah. though. I mean, yeah, but for a kid, you're for right. Baby, it's you're spicy. Saying? If I he'll say eat, spicy to my son, he's, he won't I, eat he's a, I've I've shared my jalapeno chip with him. I've had like sriracha on like my meals. And stuff. Really? Yeah, yeah. And Katrina's like, don't give it to him. I'm like, hold on. Katrina him, doesn't him. even like spicy food. No, she doesn't. Does anyone what? in her family like spicy food? Uh, her mom a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Her mom a little bit. Have I'm, you I, I probably like the. Have you tried thing. the spicy sauce that Andrew brought and has in the back? No, he's it? like real Mexican, dude. That is. I'm some, like, <laughs> I'm part Mexican, bro. That is some. That yeah, is he's not he's, authentic. He's, yeah, he's, he's too Mexican for That's me. That's hot, dude. Yeah, they probably use like the real, the, like real spicy. It's peppers. good though. I yeah. love spiciness, but I don't love what it does to me. I don't like it to ruin my day. Like I really <laughs> yeah, I, I exactly. like. <laughs> like I like spicy, but I don't like to be like the rest. <sighs> Yeah. Or like my nose to get runny from oh, it. Like that's too I don't much. mind that. It's what do you call those like Widowmaker ones that uh I was watching a show where Ghost they, Peppers or something. Yeah, Ghost Peppers and like they yeah. they have like weird like hybrids now that they've made that are just like yeah. so incredibly yeah. hot that you can't like it's a, a badge of honor even if you have like, you seen the one. video where there's these two girls and they look like they're teenage girls two or whatever. Girls in a cup? No. Jesus Adam. <laughs> Please, wow. please don't Google that. Yeah, don't okay. ever look that up. Yeah. Don't Never. do that. Is that still on the internet? I have no idea. I, Doug, look it up. Can you type that no, in? I, okay. <laughs> I refuse. So, so anyway, this uh, these are two girls that are like I don't know, like teenage girls, and they uh, think it's going to be funny to eat these super hot, dangerous. I don't know what they are, ghost peppers or whatever, on camera, and they're on camera. And then they start losing their shit and they start crying. One of them runs out. The mom comes in. The camera's still rolling. <laughs> mom comes in. Why'd you guys fucking do this? Ah, ah. <laughs> One of them's bad. on the floor. Ah, throw it up. The mom's like spraying water in her face. It's hilarious. Yeah. It's so funny. What is, what, what is, so isn't it milk they say to drink in that situation? That's what I've heard. Is it milk or I, you eat bread or? Milk. No, milk. milk. It's a base. Okay. Right? Yeah, I think, Maybe. I think yeah. milk is the, I would figure Doug would know this. I thought, I think milk I've is. I've heard that. Water is not good, I think, right? Do you know what milk does help? If your reapers, eyes reapers, right? That's what they call some of them. Like, oh yeah, the reapers. Some reapers. If your eyes burn from chlorine, milk solves that right away. Really? Yeah, my son went what? on. Oh, yes. weird! I didn't know that. My oldest went on a like, like a science camp. Like actually, drop it in. Yes. Oh, interesting. he went to science camp and they were swimming in the pool. I guess there's too much chlorine in there, and his eyes were so red and itchy, and he's like, I can barely see or whatever. Huh. And the counselor just poured milk in his eyes. Interesting. And he said it now, went away instantly. So okay, so does that work then for like regular like red eyes? Like if you have red eyes and you took like clear eyes? I don't know. I think it has to do with the chlorine. I'm, I'm not sure though. 
That's so, the yeah. next time I get really high, I'm gonna out try. There, just, put, just pour some milk in your Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, hey, can I fill Every it? once in a while when I so smoke a little too much, and I get like that bloodshot look, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. Hey, so let's fill, we'll film Adam pouring milk on his face. <laughs> <laughs> Do it I'll, 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 I'll report back <laughs> if it works or not. All right, hey, one more thing. That's a, that, This is slightly controversial. Sorry, Doug, I got to bring this up. Yeah. Uh, okay, as you guys <laughs> know, on, Canada... Man has a policy assisted suicide, right? So if you're super this. ill or whatever, it it's legal there where the doctors will come and inject you with a lethal dose of anesthesia, go to sleep, never wake up. Now, do you have to uh euthanasia? Do you have to put that or uh, on like a will or whatever like that? I think you have to authorize well, this, but but check this out. There's a new there's a new Isn't this like the whole Dr. Kevorkian he did controversy that in the US. a yeah. long time ago, right? So here's the here's the here's the new addition. They now are extending this to mentally ill patients. Which I think is terrible. Wow. Because if imagine the amount of severely depressed people yeah. who now are like, I can go and just fall asleep and never wake up, and who are going to take advantage of this particular system. I read that and I said, I can't believe they're going to do That's assisted suicide for dude. mentally ill. Wow. That is scary. That's crazy. That's I terrible. That, I have to let that sink in. Terrible. That's yeah, awful. I don't know where I sit on it, dude. Well, think about how many severely depressed. I mean, I right away get what you're saying. I totally get. Look, I because I, I mean, I, I mean, I've seen people that are mentally ill that like have also come out of it and recovered, but at one point in their life, were ready to take. Their I life. know somebody personally who didn't commit suicide because they were too afraid of the ways to commit suicide: jumping off a building, shooting themselves. They just it, it was that was the hard part. Had they had access to go to a hospital, lay down, put you to sleep, never wake up, they would have done it. Now this person's very happy. They're married. They're yeah, you know, yeah. spiritual. Wow, interesting. Yeah, dude. It's kind of wild. I read about that the other day, and I'm like, I don't know if that's a good idea. Is there a lot of controversy around it? Are you Lots of controversy. A lot mm -hmm. of controversy. So I don't know. Maybe they're trying to save money. You know? Dude. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Just well, kill them. And I mean, the thing is the explosion of depression and everything, you know, over the past couple of years, like it's, to me, that's even more alarming to, to now provide that as an alternative ulterior like it, it, option well right. imagine this An alternate imagine this now okay so we're not going to go too crazy with this but canada is a state-funded healthcare system okay so they're the, the government pays it people pay taxes into it. government covers it and as ho hospitals over there are trying to not spend money okay so you have patients in there someone's depressed or whatever they're taking up a hospital bed Maybe someone goes in there and says, hey, let's talk about some of your options. Oh, my God, dude. That's so, you're so twisted. Do you twisted. see what I'm saying? That's so yeah. twisted because <laughs> you need another bed to come in. You're like, you know, have you ever thought about just- yeah. Here's some of the you know, options you life have. Life kind of sucks for you when this you think is, about it. It's your you know? life. It's a decision you can totally That's make. so fucked up, bro. You know, and they're like, well, what's That's it going to so feel fun. like? Oh, you go into a gentle sleep. And then you just—they're like selling up. it to them. Oh my That's god! That's what I'm saying. Well, dude. bro, imagine if they actually no, if the hospitals get—what what, what if the hospitals get big money? What if the hospitals mm -hmm. get like they, like they cost insurance? Well, that's what that, that money they they say they do save because now they're saving money on. Well, they, they, not only that because they need to rotate and get a new bed in, yeah. but what if they it also the 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 method cost five thousand yeah. dollars for insurance companies and your copay handles a hundred or whatever. Well, over there it's single payer, no insurance. Oh, okay, the so government covers it. Oh, okay, so, so maybe they do get more. From that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. say the government pays the hospital five thousand dollars for the procedure or whatever inflated number right. they have. They open up a bed and they make money. Or oh, what, the God. way I would think about it is they're looking at their medical costs and they're like, we can't afford to, this medical cost. People are waiting too long. It's single payer. It's maybe whatever. And they're like, here's a great way to cut some cost. <laughs> Offer assisted suicide. Wow. Not good marketing for. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. That's that's just, that that part. I don't, that part is just all like that's part of the argument on on one side of it. I just think that's crazy that you would mentally ill people you would you you'll do assisted suicide. You know how many mentally ill people will kill themselves if yeah. it's that easy? And wow, is that I mean that's a very moral. That's a moral it's issue. Very problematic. Yeah. You know I, I I know we were trying to wrap this up, but I actually since you went down the controversial thing and you just reminded me of something that I didn't know. I just saw a tweet that Dr. Cabral did. And it said that 75% of the FDA funding comes from pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, you brought this up. Do you know, how, you know, you know what a, a majority- we've, we've brought that up before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you oh, know a majority know of the of people that work in the FDA used to work in the pharmaceutical industry? I did know And that. vice versa? I did yeah. know that. People work in I've the pharmaceutical- I've seen the charts of like the people that have the crossover, like yeah. how controversial that yeah. is. That's There's a lot of crossover, so that's, and that's kind of problematic. I, that's, you that's, think? That's, yeah, I know. We'll see what happens. Influence. Check this out. You're not what you eat. You are what you digest. Okay, so digestive enzymes are what break down your proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. So your body can utilize them to build muscle and fuel your body for your workouts. Especially if you eat a high-protein diet, digestive enzymes can make the difference. They can help with bloating, digestive issues, and help you assimilate more of these incredible 
macronutrients, especially proteins. So you got to go to see this company called Buy Optimizers. They have a product called Masszymes, and it's specifically designed for people who are interested in performance, muscle building, and fat loss. By the way, if you go to their website, you can see a video of Masszymes digesting or breaking down a piece of steak. It's really crazy, and it's really cool. Go check this company out. Go to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com forward slash mind pump. And then use the code mind pump 10 for 10% off any order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Charles from California. Charles, what's happening, man? How can we help you? I'm great. Thank you guys for having me. And uh, I just want to say that uh, I really couldn't have discovered you guys without my girlfriend. So shout out to my girlfriend. Uh, she's been listening to you guys for over, I think, three and a half years now and forever changed just how I look at uh, fitness. Oh, uh, awesome. And so my first question um, is really about symmetry. Uh, I noticed that for example, I, I think my body is out of symmetry. And some of the clues that I've picked up lately was if I put on a, a, a specific type of shirt, and I, I don't know exactly what kind of material it is, but I noticed that it would kind of, you know, go in one direction in the right side of my dominant body. And it kind of tells me that it's, uh, it's, it's pulling there more. Um, another part is probably when I'm in the middle of my workout and sometimes it will consciously uh, feel the muscles uh, kind of when I'm doing a, a barbell press, for example, uh, no, I'm sorry, a barbell squats. And um, I would notice that my right dominant side would activate more than my left side. Uh, and so my question then becomes like, how can I measure if I am out of symmetry and how can I improve on that uh, moving forward? Yeah. So Charles, first thing we're going to need to do is if you could send um, a nude picture to Sal, his phone, no. number, his phone number is... <laughs> His phone number is 408-765. Bro, that's half his number. <laughs> Fill in the rest. Don't, don't send me a nude. Yeah. I've already seen it. I won't. I won't. You know, it's easy. Uh, actually, well, relatively easy. Unilateral training. Just start training one arm, one leg at a, at a time, and this will tell you quite a bit. You'll be able to see right away which side is dominant, which side has more stability, which one has a greater range of motion, which side is stronger. Um, that'll tell you right away. And I would do a, an entire focused workout uh, plan on unilateral training. So MAP Symmetry is a program that we have that that does a lot of this. Most mm. of the phases in MAP Symmetry are unilateral, and it's designed to help bring balance to people's uh, you know body parts. And, and that balance does help people get stronger on bilateral exercises. So squats, deadlifts, bench presses, overhead presses – when you balance things out, you feel more stable, you feel more secure, you yeah. tend to be able to lift more weight. And the best way to measure this would just be your strength on each yeah. side, right? Strength, sense. stability. Like yeah. I notice when I do, I can sometimes lift the same weight on both sides, but one side feels mm -hmm. more stable than the other okay. side. So there's still a discrepancy well, there. Yeah, if you if you really do notice like a visible discrepancy, like that's it's gonna be even more glaring once you move over to unilateral training, which is gonna be great because once you get that and regain that stability uh and go back to those bilateral type of uh, movements, it's it's gonna impact it substantially. Yeah. So we'll we'll send you map symmetry. Do you have map symmetry, Charles? I don't. Okay. Although it feels like your question was kind of trying to get that for free, I'll send it to you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I take Somewhat it. Targeted. It was offered. Also, well, second, go ahead. Go, go ahead, Charles. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say your other question uh, is regards to do I think the Warriors are going to win this year? And I absolutely, I think we're going to win another championship. Oh, no, <laughs> absolutely. Day. Absolutely. That's why I'm representing right now. So I'm also from the Bay. So uh, my second question is really more out of curiosity. Um, lately, I've picked up um, just the ice bath. Uh, kind of routine. I, I I looked at um, I keep forgetting his name, Iceman from YouTube. But, yeah. yeah, and uh, I I immediately felt the difference. Uh, but number one, I'm not entirely sure when is the right time for me to use that, or is that something I could just even practice on a weekly basis? Um, and on top of that, is like um, just the other side of cryotherapy, just out of curiosity. I don't know anything about it. Like, what's your opinion on that? So it's a two-part question. I, I, if ice bath is going to give you more significant results than cryotherapy, in my opinion. Um, best time to use it? Really, it's the best. The, the, what you want to look at are the times not to use it. I probably wouldn't do it right before going to bed, and I probably wouldn't do it right after a workout. But uh, before workouts or first thing in the morning, 
or times when you need some energy, uh, perfectly fine. And so you can do it frequently. We just got one not long ago. We're actually waiting for Justin to hurry up and fix it, get it going. <laughs> I knew this was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, it's been driving me crazy because I, I actually want to do it every single day before we podcast. Yeah. So oh, wow. yeah, yeah, every day. I think there's in, there's tremendous benefits yep. to you doing it every single day. Um, I, I don't think there's a, necessarily a wrong way to do it, but to Sal's point, I, I think it's going to be less beneficial going right before to bed because it probably wake you up, right? But that, right. It, you may be okay. So I don't. And then he, the reason why he's telling you not afterwards is because there's benefits to to inflammation, right? To send the signal to build muscle, and so you don't want to dampen that signal right afterwards necessarily. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's wrong or bad to do it then. I think the most optimal time will be sometime early in the morning before mm -hmm. your training before session. Workout. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask is, is that you primarily use it to kind of stim like get the energy up early in the morning? Yes. yes. Yep. It's almost a stimulant. How yep. long do you usually stay? So I'm, I, we haven't started it yet, right? So I'll start in album because the, uh, the thing that the one we have, the cold, the, the cold plunge is the brand that we have. We can actually mm -hmm. adjust the temperature. And so I think the the recommendation the first time you get in, I want to say is like 55. Does that sound right, Justin? Like I think you started starting off. You don't need to go like the you coldest. Freezing and, freezing, yeah, a lot right? of people try and go like from cold turkey, never doing it. Uh, and then they go right into it as as cold as they can for as long as they can. No, you just you build up a tolerance for it. So uh, one of the ways you can even start it before you get one of these plunges is just in your shower. I think that's mm -hmm. Sal talks about doing that. At I home. do cold well, showers every day. And he also mentioned a, a a cool little hack too. If you don't want to fully immerse, like you can dunk your head under there uh, and get like a similar effect in terms of like that uh, exhilarating kind of a stimulant effect to that as well. So if you just do your your uh, your head and you dunk it in there a bit. Uh, has benefit to it as well. So yeah, start off at a warmer temperature. Start with a short period of time, say a minute to two minutes, and work up to and work up. Mm -hmm. You know, work up to where maybe you could sit in it as cold as possible for five minutes. I think that's you know, plenty of, of of great benefits from that. Perfect. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate the time, and um, honestly, these were uh, the questions that's kind of been bugging me, and I get uh, I got the answers now. And uh, thank you. Awesome. You got it, man. Tell I your girlfriend man. we said hi. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> and I'll, I'll be sending the nude picture. So yeah, all right, all right. All right. thank you, Charles. <laughs> Appreciate it. You got it. We're looking forward to that. That's usually that usually that's an insult, right? Hey, tell your girlfriend I said hi. You know? But she hey, she listened to the show. <laughs> she <laughs> recommended us. <laughs> she recommended us. Yeah. Yeah. If, you know, it feels like it almost feels like like if he, if he called in and he's like, hey, guys, I'm trying to get more anabolic and increase my performance. Yeah. Which programs you think? <laughs> like, wait a minute. I'm You're trying to get some OCR free... race, but I have no yeah. direction. And I want to get strong, yeah. but I like to split things. Yeah. Um, no, I, you know, um, when it comes to balance and, and unilateral training, there's so many benefits. And even if you work out a lot, you would be surprised. Doug just went through a whole cycle of map symmetry. And I was talking about it yesterday and asking him how he felt about it. And oh, maybe you can, you can talk about here how, how, you, how you did not realize. Well, I didn't realize how horrible my balance was. Yeah. Mm. Uh, just doing like the single leg toe touches and the single leg Romanian deadlifts. Man, I was just falling over at first. But little by little, of course, I got uh, a lot more balance. And then when you went to bilateral, it oh, was yeah. a difference. Strong. Yeah. Stable, definitely. right? Stable. Yeah, it makes yep. a big difference. Our next caller is Mariah from Montana. Mariah, how can we help you? Hi guys. Um, I wrote in because I recently did a uh, Dr. Cabral's heavy metal and complete candida metabolic and vitamins test. And, um, I actually did this because my boyfriend has always had gut issues. So I was kind of doing it more to support him. Um, but I actually came back that I have SIBO and, um, with that, they put me on a four month protocol and what it kind of looks like, I don't know if you guys have had to do this because I know you've had Cabral, but um, you're allowed to have, um, so you have your shake in the morning and then for lunch you have a cup of protein and then two cups of vegetables and then same thing for um, dinner. My concern with this is just the lack of protein um, within all of this. And I know like initially... They don't want you to have like eggs, gluten, dairy, anything like that. And that's not really, for me, not a big deal. Um, but just wondering, I guess on that protein side of things and working out like how to stay satiated um, through this process. Um, and I will add like right now, I'm actually doing the seven day detox. Um, and 
I haven't worked out in a week because I've done this a few times and I've just starved to death and it's been miserable. Um, so I just kind of decreased my activity so I could make it through these first two days of fasting. Yeah, Mariah, you're, wait, you're doing a seven day detox and you're following Dr. Stephen Cabral's recommendation or are you just following his recommendation? Just his recommendation. And it starts with the detox and then it moves into that SIBO. Got it. Um, Got it. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so I'm sure you, you probably looked up SIBO and, and what that all is, but for the audience, it's small mm -hmm. intestinal um, bacterial overgrowth and it can cause symptoms in people. Some are um, obvious like digestive issues. Some are not so obvious sleep distur disturbances, inflammation, Stool. skin issues. Um, and you know, you can, you can have, uh, you know, just mood issues. It can cause stuff in the body. When treating your body to improve its health, um, that is a priority over trying to improve athletic performance, strength, muscle, and fat loss. Now, mm -hmm. you are going to notice improvements in those things after you finish this protocol because you're going to be getting healthier. So, you know, if you were my client, I would say listen to the team that Dr. Cabral is working with. Follow their advice after you're done with that and you have successfully treated your SIBO, then we can move into a different protocol. Maybe one where you're focused more on muscle building or fat loss or performance or whatever other goals you may have. But in the in the in the in the time being, I would just follow their advice to a T. That's their their doctors. That's why you hired them. So I would I would just stick to that. Yeah, I, I like this question because I I can see how it can get confusing, especially if you listen to have listened to our show for a long time. You hear us preaching about you know most people under eat protein and it's so important and balancing all the macros out and we, and we, we continually push strength training and, and then you have someone like this who's telling you to go through this detox you're going to be kind of lower protein lower calorie mm -hmm. it's like and it, it seems like it's conflicting information but it's not it's you, you you're an exception to the rule here like to sal's point just to piggyback off of it like your your priority right now is not building muscle is not fat loss is to get your body as healthy and as optimal as possible and it may feel like you're taking a step back or two towards your, you know, body composition or your performance goals, but you're going to reach those goals even faster and have an easier time sustaining it after you go through this protocol. So it's well worth it, even though it may feel challenging and frustrating right now and seem like you're contradicting some of the things that you've heard us say. But I, I'm with Sal 100%. I would, in this case, I, I would defer to you follow what Dr. Cabral is saying right now. Yeah. He's, he's he's far better at helping you with something like this than I am. Yeah, and, and keep in mind the first uh, sometimes week or two weeks of a, of a SIBO protocol, you may actually start to feel a little worse first because of what's known as die-off. So as you're killing... Uh, lots of this bacterial mm -hmm. overgrowth. Um, they can produce, you know, kind of toxic byproducts. Like you may actually feel, anything. you may actually feel worse yeah. for the first week or two before you start to feel better. So kind of hang in there. And I know this, I've done SIBO protocols. I've done, um, I've done three of them mm -hmm. um, in the past. And each time the first, for me, it was like the first like four or five days where I just kind of feel worse. Um, and then I start to feel much better. Like stomach pains. And I've, I've done it before and it was like, it was headaches and kind of stomach pains yeah. and things that you kind of work your way through. But yeah, it, it, on the other end of it, obviously it was much better. So yeah. out, of, out of curiosity, did you, do you, did you have any symptoms that you've identified that could be, re be related to SIBO? Not at all, actually. Um, I eat eggs, I eat gluten, I eat dairy, like everything. I actually own chickens. Um, so I haven't noticed anything. I don't, I would say like my one thing is like, I got a new job in the last year. And so my stress level is just through the roof. Um, Cause we're about to go live on some new software. Um, but other than that, and that was a lot of the markers is just like stress level, but mm -hmm. I think it's contributing to my gut levels as well. And um, yeah, other than that though, no. Yeah, I so, feel fine. I was a little surprised. Interesting. Well, yeah. I, it'd be interesting to see what happens afterwards. I, I had a, a friend of mine that uh, tested just like you did, just general testing, mm -hmm. treated herself for SIBO and like lost a lot of water rate. Like she, she didn't realize that she was inflamed mm -hmm. um, until after she mm -hmm. was done. So I, I'd be interested to see what your experience is at the end of that four months. Yeah, definitely. Well, and it'll be helpful because actually, uh, my boyfriend, he also came back, which we expected it. We expected him to come back with SIBO as well. So, um, I mean, at least I have someone doing it with me yeah. is the way I feel. Awesome. All right. Well, well, thanks for calling in, Mariah. Yeah. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. You got it. All right. 
Did you guys know that uh, that I believe I read this? Maybe maybe Doug can look this up while I'm talking here, just to fact check me. But I think SIBO can actually be transferred between partners. It can be sexually through sexual contact. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I know we share a lot of bacteria. I mean, yes. It's just kind of inevitable when you're in that close proximity. Is, yeah. that, is that how Justin got it maybe yeah. from you? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yep. That, that one trip to Austin. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, ayahuasca. that was very specific. <laughs> <The> ayahuasca. Justin. <laughs> I remember it like yesterday. You know, you know what she <laughs> said? I farted on your sandwich. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, Ugh, gave me some I thought that tasted funny. <laughs> you know uh, what she said, though? I think that's a, an interesting point. And Sal, you're kind of alluded to it, is that, you know, a lot of times you don't think anything is wrong because your body is just amazing at being able to adapt. Yeah. And so- Or you could even just be used to- That's what I mean. Yeah. Like you've adapted to all these foods. Yeah. And, it's normal. Yeah, and it's in your normal. And so you don't think it's affecting you negatively and you don't know what feeling amazing feels like. Right. So to you, you feel good. Yeah. Like, that's how I always feel. This is, I'm, 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 exactly. I'm, I feel good. So I don't feel bad until you do something like this and then- it changes and you go, oh my God, this is what, this is what good was mm -hmm. supposed what to should feel. feel like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's hard. You know, yeah. you I have family members that are like, you know, I feel fine. I don't need to, you know, work out. I, I, I have lots of energy and then I, you know, convince them to start doing a little exercise. I go, whoa, I feel a lot better. It's like, well, you, you, you hadn't done anything for decades. You were used to your state of being. Mm -hmm. Our next caller is Joe from Utah. Joe, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, I appreciate taking the time. You got it. Yeah, man. Awesome. So my question is, how do I program exercises to strengthen my lower back and core? Uh, I tweaked my back a couple of years ago, uh, deadlifting, and it's just never really been the same. So I've scaled back quite a few times, trying to focus on form, mobility, um, and I don't really feel any pain while I lift. Um, but it's always just more than sore after or like the next day, um, or even after things like yard work or like a pickup basketball game. Um, and every once in a while, I Feel like I tweak it again. Um, workout wise, I've done the RGB bundle. I've done anabolic a second time with like some modifications that I thought would help. Um, I did MAP suspension to try and help on stability. And I'm currently through anabolic again. I'm working through that backwards. Um, I'm adding the Nobia six pack ab like exercises in there to try and work on my core. And then I'm doing things from Prime Pro and things like bird dog, cat camel, wall press, windmills before I deadlift, uh, some ankle mobility before I squat. Um, I'm not too great at doing trigger sessions or mobility days when the program calls for it, so I'm working on that. And then other than that, I'm 32 years old, 6'4", about 255 pounds. Um, I know I have forward shoulder, an anterior pelvic tilt, and poor ankle mobility from basketball and spraining that a couple times. Uh, Long story short, guys, I just want to bulletproof my back and my core, and I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Yeah. Joe, how, how often you uh, how often you golf? I never golf. Oh, you're not a golfer. I'm not a golfer. I suck at golf. Okay. <laughs> I saw the shirt. I thought maybe you were a major golfer, and I thought maybe it might be a QL thing and not enough rotational stuff in your training. Yeah, I you're doing a lot of the right stuff, but I think you uh, you would probably benefit from a good unilateral training cycle. Mm-hmm. You know, like map symmetry, I think would probably benefit you like a full cycle of it, right? 12 weeks of, uh, mostly unilateral training. There's some, there's some bilateral stuff at the end there. And I would even maybe do two cycles of that before going back to the bilateral stuff. Sometimes when you run into these stubborn issues where you seem to feel like you're doing everything right, it still seems to tweak, can't figure out what's going on. Oftentimes there's an asymmetrical imbalance. There's a, there's a balance imbalance, excuse me, between the, the left and right side in either stability or control or something that's hard to notice or see unless you're you're working out and training with a really good pr trained professional who can see these things. So I would go unilateral for just a full workout cycle and then go back and see, you know, kind of how you feel. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned a lot of really good exercises in there that you're working on and addressing. Uh, one thing like hip bridges, but like that emphasis on like addressing your interior pelvic tilt. Uh, and even like holding that isometric pose and, and really like emphasizing that at the top of the squeeze uh, to just reinforce that and, and, and gain some strength and, and, and promote that there. Uh, but in terms of like 
the rotations to Adam kind of mentioned, like that's like the windmill and, and really focusing on that and maybe, um, you know, like some Turkish getup. So we're getting everything kind of functioning and stabilizing you properly. There's got, there has to be some instability there. And so what yeah. Sal mentions, uh, in terms of, uh, the unilateral work is it's, there's really nothing better than, uh, unilateral training for directly kind of pinpointing where that problem exists. And then we can really kind of zone in a little more effectively yeah. there and build strength. Yeah, Joe, this this kind of happened to me um, relatively recently. I didn't hurt myself, but I had noticed that when I would deadlift and squat, relative, not even like max or super heavy, but some, relatively heavy, I kind of feel my like my back was going to give out or a little tweaky or I get a little more pain. I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. I feel like I have good technique, good form. I've been doing these exercises forever. And so what I did is I stopped bilateral squatting and I stopped deadlifting for, I want to say 12 weeks. And in that 12 week period, I did unilateral stuff for my lower body. So I did uh, lunges. I did single leg deadlifts. I did Bulgarian um, split stance squats. Um, I did, I pushed the sled, which isn't necessarily unilateral, but it is, it's bilateral, but you're doing kind of unilateral movements each time. Right. And I did that for about 12 weeks. Went back to deadlifts and squats, and lo and behold, I felt fine. So there was definitely something there. I couldn't pinpoint what the hell it was. I just had to start training unilateral. Now, when I went unilateral, there was definitely a difference. I could see the difference between right and left. And I said, okay, this must be it. And the reason why I had to stop deadlifting and squatting is because I'd gotten so good at squatting and deadlifting, even with moderate weight, I, I just continued to strengthen whatever the problem was, right? So even if I stick to 300 or 400 pounds, I'm you know pulling or squatting, it's enough to to keep that old signal alive, you know. So I had to get rid of that old signal, go pure unilateral with some exercises. And then when I came back, I was like, "Oh, there it is. I I, I I'm a lot better." So I'll send you map symmetry to, if you don't have it. I feel yeah, like I that'll be the perfect program. Uh, even more detail. No, thank you. A more detailed prescription. I would run map symmetry. I would do windmills, Turkish get up, and sled. Those three things, right? Mm -hmm. So those I would follow symmetry pretty much to a T. And then those three movements I would incorporate into my week, uh, just practicing them. You're not you're not trying to break any records or anything like that, just getting really good at a Turkish get up, getting really good at a windmill and and pushing the sled. And all three of those aren't gonna tax the body that bad to where it's gonna sh should impede the rest of your training routine, but I would follow symmetry and, and incorporate those three movements and, and get good at those three movements. I think that'll have tremendous benefit. Awesome. Do you, so your, your point, you're saying do those just throughout the day on off days or. Yeah, it could be, it could be off days. It could be even on training days. Like you could start off or even end your workout with Turkish get ups on one day. And then another day, uh, you end it on pushing the sled. Um, and then another day you start your workout with a, a windmill. It, you can build it into your routine. You could do it all by itself. You know, I don't know if you have a single kettlebell or a weight like that that you could do at home. Like I have a few kettlebells at my house, and so I, I I've, got a, I've got a kettlebell I can do that with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'll, you'll, I'll do this. Like when when I notice this about myself, like I have a few, and I literally have them just for windmills. And I, I'm like, you know what? I need to incorporate that again in my routine. And I just I'll go in the garage and I'll just do a couple sets on each side, and then that's all I do. You know, and just and just incorporate it into my routine a little bit like that. So it doesn't need to be. Uh, like you have to build it in, I think. So I think just incorporating that with the benefits you're going to get from symmetry, I think is going to help you out tremendously. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for, uh, thanks for calling gotta, in, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. You got Another it. quick question. Yep. Um, I'm trying to reverse diet, and I'm wondering if around 4,500 4, calories is sort of appropriate for my size to get to. I've never succeeded in cutting. Um, and I think I'm just not, I'm just always hungry. I, I can't between weekends or, um, I don't drink. Like I, I'm pretty dialed in sometimes like throughout the week, weekends, I get up in the four or 5,000 calorie range. And I'm just wondering if I can get my metabolism up there constantly, if that would be where I need to shoot for to start a well, cut from. Well, that's, you that's need to shoot for, I mean, that's an individual thing. You're 255 pounds, 6'4". You're a pretty big guy. 4,500 calories is a lot, even for a big guy like you. But if you have a really fast metabolism, like I know Adam hit that hit, would hit those numbers when he was training. He's got a really fast metabolism. And I don't think he got up to 255 pounds. So it depends on the individual. It depends how it makes you feel. Um, so I, I can't really necessarily answer that. But you can aim for it and see what happens. 
and see how you start to feel moving in that direction. You got to remember too, when it comes to reverse dieting, you got to you got to you got to build muscle along with that. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because the one thing I wanted to see, you're kind of they're the, those they're not conflicting. Not necessarily can't do both at the same time. But if the, the beginning of the question is more about like bulletproofing your body and we're trying to give you exercises to balance you out and protect, like that's kind of the focus. Like if, and then if someone comes to me and says like, I want to get my metabolism roaring as much as possible, well, we need to build as much muscle and strength as we possibly can. And they're not necessarily aligned goals. So per se, right. Right. So I mean, that's, I think I've been fighting with that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and you, uh, uh, that's a normal feeling because they're kind, you're kind of pull, getting pulled in two directions there. Like one thing, one, one part of you is telling you, Hey, I should take care of my body, which actually it'd probably be conducive to lean out a little bit and drop your calories and then do this map symmetry, like we're saying. And then the other side of you is like, man, I want to, you know, get my metabolism up to 45, which is totally obtainable for your size. I mean, I was up over 5,000 calories at 230 pounds. So it's definitely, obtainable for you to to and not an unrealistic goal to do that but i also was training like an animal i mean i was training seven days a week intensely for competing and, and walking twenty thousand steps a day so i was doing a lot of activity in addition to that and i had a lot of muscle mass to to, to ramp that metabolism up to that point so and and i wasn't focused on rehabbing taking good care of my body i was solely focused on building a metabolism getting as jacked as i could and getting on stage and so you know just keep that in mind that it, it, you if you're if you're being pulled in those two directions they both don't necessarily serve each other the best awesome that helps thank you you got it joe thanks for calling yeah. in i hey, appreciate it thank you no problem when people say i train like an animal i just picture like they're lifting weights with their teeth <laughs> ah! <laughs> that guy's crazy yeah yeah the the this isn't super common usually when someone's you know hurts himself repeatedly it's more obvious but I mean, he's saying all the right stuff. He's doing all the right stuff. Mm -hmm. And he's a big guy, probably pretty strong. Um, this, these are the times when I say, well, let's, for, for the time being, avoid the exercises that are causing the problem. Let's focus on these other movements, unilateral in his case, build that up, and then go back to those favorite movements and see how you feel. It worked for me. It worked for me. But it took me, I want to say, eight to 12 weeks when I wasn't, I didn't deadlift or squat at all. Dude, yeah. what did we do before we had symmetry? It's like, how did we suggest it? <laughs> we would say, we would just <laughs> say like, unilateral well, you know, training. We would just tell people, like, yeah, cool, yeah. I'll figure this out. Well, now we, we have it all programmed out. Yeah, so the irony of how long it easier. took to create that program we should have we should have created a that was a good ago. idea you came up with yeah. yeah it was it was yours wasn't it are you giving me credit finally yeah on camera <laughs> on camera no i i I, comfortable. The, I think the most important thing <laughs> is the comment on what we ended that with talking to him about because i think this happens a lot like how often do we get these callers and they always got like two questions and i a lot of times i feel like the two things they want to do are like competing things yeah. and it's not it's not necessarily not competing, necessarily but i mean you're if you're chasing size and strength and you're also trying to balance out the mentality is a little it's totally it doesn't different. match up yeah. it's totally different that's why i wanted to give them the analogy of like when i was trying to get my metallic that i was not trying to take care of my body i was 100 yeah. percent focused on aesthetics ramping my yeah. metabolism up yeah. looking a certain Pure way performance yeah training. and then when i went to the shift of okay it's time to increase my squat depth and work yeah. on my ankle mobility it's like I completely and I was not thinking I was not going to have the most roaring metabolism at that time. I knew that I was pro inevitably probably going to lose a little bit of muscle mass along the way. Like that's just it's just part of the kind of the process because your mentality has to, to yep. shift. So yep. our next callers, John from D.C. John, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Thank you, gentlemen, so much for your time. Really appreciate what you do. And thank you for bringing the intelligent, thoughtful commentary on fitness and health really appreciate it thank you um, awesome um, also want to extend thanks to doug and your entire mom pump, my pump team for supporting the show i don't think they get enough love but uh, i want oh, to say that as well. uh, give doug some love yeah that's good yeah yeah he needs so that. my yeah i want to be quick my question to you is regarding my family and my kids um my 13 year old son has approached me about lifting weights and i have about i have four kids from age of ages ranging from 13 to seven. And I've been thinking about how do I approach structuring a fitness regimen or even thinking about big rocks for things that need to be accomplished at earlier ages before they actually start lifting weights. And we'll love your thoughts on how do I think about um, introducing either weights or introducing calisthenics or et cetera to my kids at different ages. If you were to structure sort of a program running from ages seven through high school 
what would you start with and then what we kind of progress towards? Oh gosh. With the ages that you just gave us, um, body weight, closed chain yeah. movements would be where I'd start. So I, I don't care if they're playful four, movements. Yeah. I don't care initially. if you're 13 or seven. Now, once you get to like 17, 18, 19, you can start with dumbbell barbell movements, but even then closed chain movements like push ups and body weight squats and pull ups and, and dips, dips. So, so, um, a great program for your kids that would be appropriate for all of your kids. So long as they do the exercises, right. And they're, you know, you watch them, make sure they don't do anything crazy would be map suspension. Map suspension would be great. It's all body weight. It's all body control. And once they run through a cycle of that, your 13-year-old in particular, once they run through a cycle of map suspension, then I'd put them on something like uh, maybe maps resistance or even pre-phase of maps anabolic, so long as their movement is good, um, and, and monitor their form and technique and make sure that it's all yeah. form and technique focused. And that's it. But they're all, all of them, strength training is appropriate for all ages. It's not, it's not, it's only dangerous if you do it wrong. It's only dangerous if you're reckless. Otherwise, it'll benefit all of their movement, their health. Gymnastics, for example, is phenomenal, especially yeah. for your youngest, your seven year old. Gymnastics right now would have so much carryover um, for the rest of the life. Well, the, re the reason why this question is, is a little difficult to answer with like really good prescription from us is because um, you, I've seen, uh, you know, seven to 13 year olds uh, that just, they, they just have this ability to put you, you as a dad, you show them a proper push up, they, and they do it, they do it like, yeah. you know, two or three times. And then all of a sudden they can do it. They can model it to a T. And then mm. I've seen other, you know, 13 year olds, you show them time and, and they are just hips are all over the place. They're dipping down. I mean, they just look like an absolute mess. And so those two people, those two different scenarios, I, I can progress them completely different. I mean, I, if I got a kid who I can teach mechanics to and I can see their, their, they can emulate it relatively quick, right, to almost, almost perfect, right? They don't have to be perfect, but they can get it down pretty damn well pretty fast. I can really progress that kid to getting them to barbells and dumbbells relatively quick. Yeah. But then if I have a kid who is just an absolute disaster and all over the place, I'm, I'm, I, I would probably stick to a lot of body weight movements for a long time until I can get them. That I mean, place. you're going to see that all the way up to the high school level. I'm finding out. So that that's just one of those things they call it like the, you, you, you got to structure something. If I'm creating something for a group of kids, it's like, I got to consider the baby draft, the one that's like all over the place. Um, but yeah, in terms of those, those age spans, you're going to get a wide variety of abilities. And for the most part in the beginning, like the, the biggest concern is for them to understand how to control their body how to be able to stabilize and be able to, um, you know, uh, uh, go through these movements with, with intention. Um, so to, to create just uh, an environment for them that they want to participate in, I think is the biggest thing. And so if that's, you know, some kind of a structured sport or, uh, something where, um, you know, you guys do it as a family, like you're just doing a workout and they kind of like watch and want to try something like that's kind of how I approached it with my kids. And then, you know, created things outside for them to climb. I think climbing is a very valuable uh, way to introduce a lot of control and strength and, and demand in that regard and, and understanding their body and control. Uh, and then, you know, progressively kind of introduce them to other types of like suspension is a good one just because it does really force the issue of balance and, and stability and control on strength. Um, and then, you know, from there, it's just kind of one of those things, how much interest they have uh, is how much I then start to incorporate, um, you know, the next sort of layer to that uh, in, in terms of like going from there to now, um, can they, can they maintain a position? And then also can I load that position? So uh, that's sort of like just this this constant progressive way of looking at uh, where their abilities are and how I can match it. I, I really love Sal's recommendation with the suspension trainer because you really could do, you could do suspension, you could do starter, you could do anywhere. They all could kind of fit in that category. But I really like sus the sp suspension trainer since you have all different age groups and you can easily progress it or regress it with one tool, right? Easy. Just by their stepping their feet away or closer to the wall, it makes the exercise that much more challenging. I think the thing that you don't want to do that I think some parents do is they 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 overcomplicate it. I literally am going to do a push, a pull, a squat, and maybe a handstand. Mm -hmm. Those are that's it. Those four things. If I can get my kid to do like a a push up, a, a body row, 
uh, balance on their hands and do some squat, like split body weight stance. Yeah, yeah either position. yeah, split stance squats or bilateral squats, or sing, get a, eventually you know with the assistance of the suspension, get them to do a single leg squat. Like man, those those four movements right there, get really good at those four movements, and with the suspension trainer, you can progress it by making it more challenging. Where you put, I mean, that is it's also fun. You you leave mm -hmm. the suspension trainer up and just watch your kids walk by it and mess around with it and practice exercises. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm going to send that program to you if you don't have it because I think that. That'd be perfect. Oh, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. You got it, man. Thanks for calling in, John. Right on. My pleasure. Yeah, I remember. I remember first getting into strength training. How prevalent the myth was that strength training would um, stunt my growth. <laughs> yeah, I remember my mom being, "Oh, you're gonna stunt your growth. You're gonna damage your growth plates." And you know, of course, I, I not knowing if it was true or false, didn't give a. I didn't care. I was like, I'm going to work out anyway. Yeah. Like, and now we know. I just want muscle. I don't care if I'm short. Yeah, but now we know. <laughs> Luckily, at 14, I was already pretty tall. But no, um, now we know it's a, that's a total myth. I mean, to yeah. damage yeah. growth plates, you would have to load a kid to the point where they can't lift the weight anymore. They have yeah. to hurt themselves. Yeah. So, But it's very beneficial. And body control is very important for little kids. Yeah. Like being able to do strength training, but with their body. Because like, it gives them such good body awareness. Yeah, and to that point of the myth, like I was like all apprehensive to to introduce kids to like compound lifts and things like that. But, you know, like if they learn really early how to master the, you know, the, that technique and the mechanics of it, it really not loading it specifically, but having them go through that and you're teaching it. Um, that's something they can build upon the rest of their life. Totally. And, and yeah. it's, it's a skill that they can acquire young, which is great. Uh, it's just really about how you, uh, you introduce it and, and you teach it uh, properly. Completely. Look, if you like mind pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of... 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out. And less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.